come to you today as an absolute disaster of a human. I mean, for those of you who have been around my channel for a while, that will come as no particular surprise. And if you are new here, then hi, hello, welcome, and I'm sorry. Was originally going to be entitled one in and one out. I was going to do an unhaul and a haul all in the one video but when I did the maths I then realized that it was going to be more like one out and however many I could carry in. So instead what I bring to you today is a one book out and a few questions in. Let's throw out some books and answer some burning questions that you guys may or may not have had for a long time. The first book that is going bye bye is a book that was not actually awful for me. It was just kind of meh. I just kind of nothing this book. It's almost the lowest compliment that I can give. The book that I'm talking about is The Mothers by Britt Bennett. This is about a young girl called Nadia whose mother commits suicide and in the midst of her grief and just her non-feeling she ends up hooking up with the pastor's son essentially and accidentally getting pregnant and the repercussions of this for Nadia and Luke and their very annoying friend Audrey Aubrey I don't know. I don't even want to read her name again ever again. It did my two least favourite things in literary fiction. It was a little bit pretentious and it was a little bit too unrelentingly bleak and while I absolutely know that some people's lives are unrelentingly bleak, you know when I pick up literary fiction I'm wanting like a, a fully rounded life story with joyous moments and there were very few in this book very few. So uh, this one is going and uh, there's quite a few at the top of the stack that are actually going to a new bookish home already so I don't feel quite as bad about ejecting them from my life. Okay let's do a couple of questions. Caitlin X Marie asked two really good questions. First of all what's your favourite hobby besides reading and what I have recently discovered whilst working towards an adult ADHD diagnosis is that what I thought was just like an eclectic personality where I liked to do a lot of things uh, is not actually just an eclectic personality it's just ADHD hyper focus so I have a lot of hobbies I like to game right now it's like Animal Crossing and Life Simulator games I love that kind of stuff I also like RPG games and a few you know other things I knit I knit for family and friends I never knit for myself <laughs> And of course I illustrate which is now my main business which used to be a hobby when I was in 9 to 5 crushing soul destroying workplaces and is now the thing that I do for a living and I have an Etsy shop and you can check it out here where I have a myriad of bookish goodies. Self promo thoroughly out of the way, Caitlin X Marie also wants to know what kind of horror movies do I like and do I watch horror movies and the answer is absolutely yes horror movies and true crime are my two comfort genres of choice. The Conjuring is one of my favourite comfort films, I don't really know what that says about me but I really really enjoy it. Actually also Jared Brittle I think's book this one can't remember the title right now on Ed and Lorraine Warren's life is absolutely fascinating and I thoroughly recommend the audiobook where there is a few demonic possession exorcism tapes littered in there just saying Donna is reading asks what was the last book that you are happy about not DNFing this is a really clever question so this one I will answer a Caribbean mystery which is the fourth third or fourth from the end of the Miss Marple series the one thing that I like the least with the Miss Marple series is the books where she's taken out of her comfort zone so she's not in like St Mary Mead which is her town this one she goes to the Caribbean on a cruise and I just was I was not there for it but I couldn't not finish it because it was the next in like a I don't know 15 or 16 book long series so I went back and I did it again and I was really glad that I did because now it's one of my favorite Miss Marple books go figure. The next book which is leaving my house feels almost blasphemous to show on camera because there are so many people out there who will go to battle for this author but the book is Bonk by Mary Roach that's a really satisfying title to say in a Scottish accent, bonk. This book is of course about the science of sex. I, I love the little line on the back which says what happens and why and how to make it happen better which ultimately don't we all want but oh, I'm sorry guys.
guys, I just don't think Mary Roach is for me. She does do a great job of giving like a very broad overview of the subjects that she is interested in because she delves into all different subjects and thus becomes like a semi-expert on all of them. And that was exactly what this felt like. It felt like an overview of sexual science with a few like hit points in there. She is funny. She is informative while being tongue-in-cheek. Don't know if that was the, the best euphemism to use in this <laughs> A lot of the like science has moved on, a lot of the way that we use language around sex and the things that are taboo and things like that have moved on so I also felt like this one was a little bit dated. Let's do another book before we go back to the questions. Loch Down Abbey by Beth Cowan Erskine. So this is a sort of spoof murder mystery which both takes the piss out of Downton Abbey and also literally walked down during the pepperoni. This is about a family who own a beautiful big mansion in the Highlands and a pepperoni essentially has taken over their like surrounding areas and so they all retreat back to the family home which makes a lot of personalities clash and there's like air struggles and there's upstairs downstairs stuff and that's all the stuff that you would ideally want to see from Downton Abbey and it says in the back <laughs> the residents are much more concerned with dwindling lavatory paper supplies and who will look after the children now that nanny has regretfully and most inconveniently departed this life so they don't really care about the fact that nanny is dead and you're not really meant to root for anybody in this book either but nanny is sort of dead in a oh she's dead oh that's unfortunate oh wait she was murdered way and then it kind of harks back to things like marple and poirot and you know other golden age crime and then it gives you a locked door golden age crime mystery as well and it's just really fun it's really fun there's a lot of allusions to current events in here i really really enjoyed it but yeah it just it doesn't need to live in my house because i'm never going to read it again from julie reads asks middle grade rex and yes absolutely I have a few underrated middle grade series on my shelf that I like to talk about a lot. One of them is Goth Girl by Chris Riddle. It is about a little girl who lives in a big gothic mansion with her father who's just a little bit shit and her mum died very tragically and very spectacularly many years ago and she has to kind of make her way very much alone in the world but while she's doing that she's making her way through a series of nannies and all of these nannies represent one trope or another that has been played out previously in Victorian and Gothic novels. So basically Chris Riddle's entire series kind of just takes the piss out of everything that happens in especially British literature up until about 1910. It's a series that I would say is definitely much more for adults than it is for kids. You will get much, much more of the joke. And there is a book later on in the series, this book, <laughs> which pokes fun at the Great British Bake Off as well. It's just, it's a great series, very underrated. Don't know why more people don't talk about it. A Pop of Jess asks, which format would I pick if I could only ever read in one again? So I'm gonna say out of hardback, large paperback, normal paperback, mass market paperback, or Kindle, right? So mm, I'm gonna go for hardback. I know it's controversial. I know a lot of people find hardbacks to be bulky and uncomfortable, but I love everything about them. I love that they creak when you first open them. I love the end pages. I love the French flaps. I love that there's always a surprise under the dust jacket. I even love the very, very plain hardbacks that look just like beautifully published older vintage books like I just I love everything about them okay don't judge me. Sarah asks what is my favourite place besides a bookstore where I live and it is absolutely 100% Hopeton House. Hopeton House is the oldest stately home in Scotland. It is very grand. It's very beautiful. They filmed part of Outlander there. In fact, they now have to have an entire separate map for the tourists that come for Outlander. I like to go in the off season when the leaves are falling and walk the grounds. It's perfect. The next book that I am parting company with is The Ghost Bride by Yancey Chu. This was actually a really good read for the most part. It is about Leland, I think. Yes, Lee Lan, who lives in 1890s Malaysia and she has been given as the bride to a dead son of a prosperous family and she doesn't want that for herself and she wants to find a way out of it essentially. 
and the writing in this is absolutely beautiful but the pacing is really really incredibly off there's so much in here in terms of detail and things that Leland has to find out and it just feels like it rushes to get there and then it takes a really long time to explain anything by which point it's no longer a reveal I'm just bored can we get to the next thing with a little bit of editing and tweaking this could have been a five star book but as it was it was like yeah three and a half four if I still used ratings it would be then amongst there somewhere and another book that I am getting rid of not because it is an awful book by any means but just because I will absolutely not ever read it again is I Let Him Go by Denise Fergus. Denise Fergus is the mother of James Bulger who is very famously the extremely young boy in the UK who was abducted and walked miles and miles and miles across town and then murdered by two very very young boys I think they were 9 and 11 at the time maybe a little bit younger than that I can't remember now I read a lot of books about this case it's a case that absolutely fascinates me by far the best book that I have read about it is The Sleep of Reason this one takes a very broad look at things in that it also considers the families of the boys who did it to be victims in this crime not just you know obviously James's family. I would not recommend James's father's book at all. It was definitely written at a bad time in his father's life. It was ghostwritten and I personally consider this book to be quite exploitative whereas Denise's book comes from many many years later when she has done charity work, processed this, really thought about whether this was something she wanted to put out into the world and it's beautiful. It's a gorgeous gorgeous book and she can write and I really felt like I was there in the moment which was awful but it is just not something that I will go back and read so this one is going to leave my shelves. The next book that I'm getting rid of is one that has been very very talked about among certain circles in booktube and it's been very interesting to see the varying reactions to it. For me I am in the camp of I see what it was trying to do, it was interesting but ultimately I didn't really care that much. That book is of course The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward. This one is kind of a thriller but it's kind of not. You are immediately thrown into the head of somebody who has a very very confusing train of thought. I liken the narration in this one to I've thinking I, I'm thinking about I have thought about ending thing. This book that I hated that I occasionally drag up to talk about because I hated it so much because it was so convoluted. It reminds me of that one both in tone and unreliable narrator and where the story takes you but yeah this one was just not for me and Stephen King on the front says I haven't read anything this exciting since Gone Girl which just says to me that Stephen King has probably just been reading male authors which actually neatly just in between a couple of these books takes me onto this question from Dawn which in summary essentially means do you have any recommendations for men who write women well who are not Terry Pratchett because Dawn has very much given up on male authors and I thought to myself when I looked at that question probably and then I looked at my shelves and I was like actually do you know what probably not because I didn't realise this but 99% of my shelves are now female authors or non-binary authors. I have a very small selection of men still on my shelves. I'm not sorry about it. I feel like women and non-binary authors are able to write both uh, women and men and everything in the spectrum in between uh, perfectly well so I don't particularly seek out men or male authors. Okay back to books that I hated. You guys all know how absolutely obsessed I am with Sweet Pea by CJ Scoose. It's one of my favourite books in the entire world. I talk about it all the time. It is about a girl next door who turns out to be a serial killer. You are reading things from her point of view but it very much could be you or me or any of our friends because she makes kill lists all the time. Uh, they include people in the supermarket who bruise her apples and they include people who are annoying in her very boring job. And she has a very normal life, it's just that most of the time she does actually carry out her kill lists. And uh, that book left on a cliffhanger which I didn't think it needed to have and then it followed on to two other books and I am covering up the spoiler which they have 
printed on the front of this book just in case you do actually want to read the next two which are In Bloom and Deadhead. So I uh, I was very meh about In Bloom, like very meh about it. I don't think it needed to exist and again I was a bit naffed off with the fact that the middle of the book just went nowhere and did nothing interesting. Nothing like the first book for me. And then this one was just an all out fail and I completely DNF'd it and I was just like no I, d I just don't I just don't need it I don't need this to be a series the first book was enough and so these are going to leave my shelves before I get on with any more questions it has just occurred to me that I have not mentioned something pretty momentous in our life which has shifted so I am just going to quickly address that here in case it comes up again. You guys all know my lovely other half is a huge feature on my channel. You guys love seeing the videos that we do together. My patrons definitely love coming to the live streams where we are there together. So I think it's really important to update you guys and let you know that my beautiful other half now goes by the name Lovely Spouse Harry and that is what their social media now is. All of their links have changed. I am so incredibly proud of them for making this huge step. They publicly changed their pronouns about mm, four or five months ago and that was like a a first step and the reception from you guys on Instagram which is where Harry primarily hangs out was just so lovely so lovely and so encouraging and I genuinely think that you guys were part of the reason that they felt so comfortable to so quickly afterwards change to their true name so just in case this comes up again at any point in this video, I will probably do a longer video at some point with Harry where we can talk about this, but my lovely other half is now Harry. And uh, here again, here are all the links, because you should follow them because they post pictures of our pets and mushrooms and sometimes me. So <laughs> go follow them. Okay, so let's answer a more serious question on the back of that. Anaisa Travels asks, what has been the most beneficial thing for you when you are low? And honestly, the biggest piece of advice that I can give you that was like a huge revelatory piece of advice when it was given to me was sit with your feelings for a minute and allow yourself to feel them all the way through. What I mean by that is that as a society, we have been conditioned that when we feel bad or when we are panicked or when we're feeling any of those negative emotions that we should not feel them and so we immediately try to stop them which means that we don't ever actually allow ourselves to experience them and feel them all the way to the other side when i am having a panic attack now or intrusive thoughts or a really really uh moment of complete disordered thinking instead of going oh my god this is terrible i don't want to feel this push it as far away as possible i instead let myself sit with it for five minutes i let myself feel the bad thing i acknowledge that i am feeling the bad thing and then more often than not it goes away and it goes away quicker and it allows me to get back to what i'm doing actually talking about it out loud also helps and i think that it's really underrated because we do as a society tend to just be like oh you're feeling a bad thing i'm so sorry you should feel good all the time feel better now please with that exact note of panic because they just want you to stop and i think that's a big thing when you're supporting anybody with mental health difficulties in your life because i think a lot of the time people like to support or say that they support people with mental health difficulties when they're in their up times and their functioning times when they're able to talk about their mental health difficulties but they don't often talk about them when they're in their low times and they're having you know anger or feelings of hopelessness or things that are outwardly less tasteful to deal with and so I think if you're supporting somebody in your life who has that it's important to let them have those moments where they get to be that other person and then just like support them to the end of it because you know that that feeling will end but they have to actually be allowed to feel it first that was really deep let's go by the books the next two books that i'm getting rid of i don't have a tremendous amount to say about them because i dnf them quite early on but the first one is untold night and day by bay shaw 
this one is a, a weird sort of almost thriller one foot in speculative fiction the way that it is told and I didn't like it. From the very first page I was like I feel uncomfortable here. The narrator writes very heavily from a narrator's point of view so they are very much giving you the former actress such and such did such and such they were sitting here and it, I feel the author's presence and I feel like I'm having strings pulled and that's one of the things that I hate the most in books is when I feel like somebody is manipulating me into feeling something instead of actually just making me feel the thing with like good writing and plot structure and stuff it's a shame because this one was a gift from a lovely subscriber and thank you very much but occasionally that happens we can't like every book and uh, this one is going to another wonderful bookish home shortly. Another one unfortunately that was gifted to me uh, is a book that I loved the premise of but the actual execution just was not working and that is The End of Temperance Dare, a novel by Wendy Webb. This one said that it was like haunting and atmospheric and the back of the book calls Wendy Webb like the new queen of northern gothic and I didn't, I was not getting gothic from this. I was getting a, these are all of the things that I think are gothic so I'm going to mention them all in a row in this book. That was what I was getting from this. I did not enjoy. Hugs and Pages asks and I'm just gonna read this out. I know you're human and have your struggles with mental health and chronic illness but you come across as a very loud <laughs> in a good way bubbly confident person who you always been that way and any tips on how to find that confidence and bubbliness. So I think the short answer to this is no absolutely not. I have not always been this way. For a start I like to describe myself as an introverted extrovert. I do really really well with people but I would prefer not to. <laughs> But generally I am, um, yeah, I'm quite chatty. I like to think I'm a quite welcoming and approachable person. So yes, if you ever see me in a bookshop, you are more than welcome to come up and say hello. Uh, I would I would enjoy that. That being said, uh, I had a lot of mental health difficulties when I was a kid. I was a very, very shy, quiet kid who didn't get a lot of social interaction when she was younger. And I did not learn how to people until I hit high school and realised that I could not function in, you know, society. I couldn't function with my peers and I ended up uh, being agoraphobic for a year and a half. I didn't leave my house and then I ended up in inpatient therapy. I guess a lot of the tips that I see people hand out when they talk about confidence and meeting people and talking to people are always around that, oh, you just need to stop caring what other people think. And I, I largely have, of course, some things still get past the shield and dent you, but I largely don't care what other people think. I'm very confident in myself and how I look and stuff. But I think that that's not really that useful because in order to stop caring what other people think you first have to care what you think about yourself and you have to change the way that you think about yourself. And for me it took a lot of unpicking other people's expectations, um, other people's uh, the diet culture, uh, body dysmorphia stuff. It took a lot of me doing really really deep introspective work to be like no actually I am a kind person, I am a nice person, people do want to spend time with me and it, that's been a lifetime in the making so there, there is no quick cure to that but what I, I would say is that if you are struggling with this then I think mostly the work needs to be on you first before you present you to everybody else. You have to like you first. If you don't like you then you're not going to present the best you to other people and they won't get the best chance to like you either. Okay so I'm going to do the last three books back to back and then I'm going to answer one final question that I think is a really important question so let's get to it. Speaking of Stephen King and Gone Girl, wow this book is so bright, it is so, it's so bright ads I do not enjoy. This is my least favourite Gillian Flynn book. I love all of her other books. Uh, I feel like Gillian Flynn gets better when you read her backwards. It'll be interesting when she comes out with something new to see if that continues as a trend for me. But Gone Girl was always my least favourite. I hate the characters in it but not in a way where I was loving to hate read them. Just in a way where I was like you're both really deplorable people. It is at heart a domestic thriller and you guys know I don't like domestic thrillers really. I don't like reading books in which I can see that the solution is you two should just not be together. No longer talk and we won't need any of this stuff. 
so this one is going but again it's going to a wonderful bookish home next up i have sisters by michelle francis one's the favorite and the other knows it i really really love books about sisters particularly when they are twisty thrillers i think that's my favorite thing about karen slaughter's books i don't know this one just didn't hit the mark for me again i felt like it was hitting all the classic trope points for a thriller but I didn't feel like I was getting anything really genuine from it. The writing was also very nothing. It's a trash thriller but for me not like a fun trash thriller just like a, oh, why am I reading this kind of trash thriller. We cannot win them all and I think this last book is pure evidence of that because this is The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Remember how I said earlier on in the video that I absolutely love hardbacks, I love the production of them, I love everything? This is one of those hardbacks. This is a beautiful hardback and it has beautiful end pages and it's just, it's stunning and I don't want to give it up. I want it to stay on my shelf. This one is a Agatha Christie-esque murder mystery but with Groundhog Day essentially and so we every time we go back we learn new facts about Evelyn Hardcastle's murder and we have to try and piece together how we got there how she ended up murdered and for me that was it it was like I'm finding nothing interesting here about going back to the same day again and again like you have to really have a good hook it was boring and convoluted i wasn't convinced by the groundhog thing i was just like really is this happening really mm. so those are all of the books that are leaving my house but the last question i got from my lovely april from getting hugo with it i love april to pieces and again i'm just gonna read it because i think that it's really important for anybody who exists on the internet april says i think all of us would thank you for being so open about your mental health um, I think it's helped many. That said, I know sometimes being open can be a hard thing and not everyone is kind on the internet. How do you handle those moments or comments? I have had, in no particular order, comments on my teeth, comments on the way that I speak, comments on how loud or how extra I am, comments on the way that I dress, comments on the fact that I don't have a, I don't know, a classic... Scottish accent or whatever the hell that is. Did I mention comments on weight? Because I've had a lot of them. I've had comments from men on videos telling me that I'm reading things incorrectly. So do I occasionally read a comment and have a moment of completely irrational or perfectly rational, let's not gaslight ourselves, perfectly rational anger at that comment? Yes. Do I let it impact my day? No. The minute that I had this channel, my philosophy was just read what you like, support other people in reading and enjoying what they like and don't be a dick. And I think that's why those comments don't bother me as much because if you actually sit and break down what they are, they are one person who feels that their opinion is so important that you need to hear it and you need to hear it right now and they are entitled to tell you it. Unless it's legitimate criticism, unless I have actually done something offensive or accidentally uh, used a, a term wrong or in a, a couple of occasions I have accidentally misgendered an author and I now try to use they if I haven't actually seen that author's social media and know otherwise. You know if it's something like that then absolutely I welcome that conversation but if it is just somebody else's opinion in your space I I absolutely advocate for you to just delete that shit. <laughs> they are allowed to have that opinion. Absolutely. They are allowed to have that opinion and they are allowed to go say it on their page wherever they like it and their curated place in the internet that they keep their stuff. They're not allowed to bring that opinion to you and foist it upon you. You are not there to create content for people to give you opinions on. You are there to create content that you enjoy that hopefully other people will enjoy and create a community of people who will enjoy it. That was a way to finish a video. I I'm gonna just step back down quietly off my thought box and, and we will we will finish up so thank you all for your questions i really really liked this format of unhaul if you guys like it please let me know in the comments below and i will definitely do it again and as always if you have read any of the books from my unhaul stack and you think that i am 
wrong you think that I am a trash human please tell me down below in the comments and I will speak to you guys soon bye is the function of glasses meant to be to see out of them because if so I am also failing at that aspect of my life Thank you.